The first of the Orioles' five free agents from 2023 has signed a contract, but it's not re-signing in Baltimore, as Kyle Gibson instead signed a one-year deal with a team option for year two with the St. Louis Cardinals. So what does that mean for the O's, and should they have pursued Gibson? We'll talk about that and more coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to take a look at the Kyle Gibson signing as he is done in Baltimore after just one season, officially signing a one-year deal with the St. Louis Cardinals on Tuesday. We'll break down the deal, why the Cardinals did it, and then take a look at should the Orioles actually have brought Gibson back for another season. I'll make the case for and against that on today's episode before finally taking in a few other news and notes from around the league, specifically some signings and some trades that happened elsewhere that the Orioles could have potentially been interested in or involved with. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 just if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. So the news for the Orioles, at least on Tuesday, was not necessarily a signing they made. They really haven't made one yet so far this offseason as I record here on uh, Tuesday night. But one of their five free agents has signed elsewhere. The first domino to fall there is Kyle Gibson, who it was reported on Tuesday has signed a one-year $12 million deal with the St. Louis Cardinals that includes a team option for 2025 as well. You would have to think that team option would be for somewhere around 10 to 12 million, very similar for a second year if the Cardinals wanted to. But that is more money than Kyle Gibson did make this year. He was on a one-year $10 million contract with the Orioles this season, so he parlayed his season into a little bit of a raise for 2024. Now, Obviously, we know the Orioles are looking for starting pitching, but there is no team in baseball this offseason looking for starting pitching more aggressively, or at least so you would think, than the St. Louis Cardinals. This is a team that's been to the playoffs over and over again, but this year was a disaster. And the offense was not the issue. It was still a great lineup with Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt and a lot of good young hitters, but it was a disaster of a starting rotation for the Cardinals this year. They had multiple guys who shouldn't be making big league starts. Adam Wainwright was horrible. They gave him the ball every five days. He has since retired. Miles Michaelis took a large step back. And, you know, Jack Flaherty wasn't very good. Was worse with the Orioles. And they traded away Jordan Montgomery at the deadline. They basically have to revamp their entire starting rotation. Kyle Gibson is going to be one of those pieces. Now, they also brought in Lance Lynn on a one-year deal with a team option as well. That came on Monday, and we'll talk about that deal a little bit coming up as well. But for Kyle Gibson, it's a deal that makes sense and doesn't for the St. Louis Cardinals. And the way it makes sense is that the Cardinals didn't have a lot of starters that they could trust to just give them innings, give them solid innings in 2023. This is going to be an upgrade for the Cardinals. They they Their rotation was not good. And what Kyle Gibson gave to the Orioles was at least respectable, in 2023. He made 33 starts, stayed healthy the entire year, 192 innings from Kyle Gibson, a 4.73 ERA, yes, was a little little below league average, but 4.13 FIP was better, showed he got a little unlucky, 49% ground ball rate, still a really solid ground ball starter, 20% strikeout rate, not great, but a very low walk rate that was under 7% for the season. It was a okay year for the 35-year-old righty in his one and only season in Baltimore. But you look at some of the other things he did, like he had a 2.45 ERA in September, helped the Orioles immensely down the stretch to win that division. He threw a really strong three innings in relief in ALDS Game 3 in the postseason against the Rangers. It was already too late, and I've made my case he probably should have started that Game 3 in Texas instead of Dean Kramer, but either way, he pitched well. And although he was kind of bad at times, more than half of his starts were quality. 17 of his 33 starts were quality starts, 
a start of at least six innings with three earned runs or less allowed, and those were starts that gave this Orioles team a really good chance to win every time Kyle Gibson did it. So because of that, I thought it was a positive, and at the very least, he was an upgrade over Jordan Lyles, and that is what the Orioles brought him in to do. And, you know, he did kind of develop an elite pitch this season. He had elite pitches back when he was younger with the Twins, not as much recently, but that sweeper that he found the form of this year was his second most used pitch, used it 19% of the time. Opponents hit just 147 against it, and it had a 47% swing and miss rate. That is an elite pitch, especially from a starting pitcher. That's what Gibson's sweeper was. And at times, he struggled with the command, but when it was on, that was one of the best pitches on the entire Orioles starting staff. That's how good he was at times, and that allowed him to pitch really deep into games and give the Orioles some really, really good starts this season. Now, that's all the good for him and the Cardinals. The bad is... The Cardinals got Lance Lynn, which we'll talk about, and they got Kyle Gibson. These are two older, mid to late 30s innings eaters that, you know, you would like to have if you have both of them. They are number four and number five in your rotation. The Cardinals needed number one and two guys, right? And they could still go out there, and they were in on Aaron Nola, reportedly, and they could go and get Yamamoto. They could go and get Blake Snell. They could go and get, I don't know, back. Like, there's still guys out there for him. But it was kind of interesting for the Cardinals to also do this with Kyle Gibson when they had already went and got Lance Lynn. But of course, this isn't Locked on Cardinals. That is a podcast that exists, and you can go listen to it if you want more insight on the Kyle Gibson news from their perspective. This is Locked on Orioles. I was thinking about this week, before the Gibson news dropped that he had signed the deal with the Cardinals, thinking about doing an episode this week, because we know the Orioles are going after pitching, and I was just digging deeper and deeper into Gibson's numbers and his one season with the Orioles this year, and just thinking, you know, he shouldn't be their top signing. In no way should he, but would it actually make some sense for the Euros to bring Kyle Gibson back? And that was, I was thinking, and before I got a chance to do the episode, the Cardinals signed him. He's not coming back to Baltimore. But I can still lay out the case. Should the Orioles have paid that extra $2 million, paid $12 million, and brought Kyle Gibson back? I'll make the case for it coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. You can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 just if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. And the app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options for all three of the NFL games on Thanksgiving tomorrow, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So we're talking the Kyle Gibson signing news as he signs a one-year $12 million deal with the St. Louis Cardinals. That includes a team option for the 2025 season as well. So it could be two years in St. Louis for Gibson. And I'm sure he's a guy who, you know, maybe considered with his family and all the things he does off the field, maybe hanging it up after 2023. But I think he showed this season, despite a 4.73 ERA, that he is still a productive major league starting pitcher. Now, is he going to be above anyone's number four or five? No, he shouldn't be, but he can still be a big league pitcher and he can still get $12 million to do it. And that's probably one of the big reasons why he signed with the Cardinals on Tuesday. But the question now becomes, okay, the Orioles gave him $10 million for 2023. Seems like he would have cost $12 million and, you know, maybe the option as well for 2024. Should the Orioles have made that deal and brought him back? Now, Some people who have been very anti-Kyle Gibson would have said there's no way. I'm pretty much on the pro-Kyle Gibson train, and I don't think I was ever beating the drum significantly this offseason saying they absolutely need to re-sign Gibson, but I'm sure it's something the Orioles considered, and maybe they should have considered it a little bit more. Like, you never know what kind of offer they may have given Gibson. I don't know if we'll ever find that out. But let's have this conversation assuming Assuming, and this is a large assuming from what we've seen so far from John Angelos and Mike Elias, assuming the Orioles get another starter who's more of a top-of-the-rotation guy. Assuming they trade for a Dylan Cease. They trade for a Corbin Burns, right? Or maybe they... No, they're not going out and spending big money. So let's assume they traded for a top-of-the-rotation guy. And maybe in that deal, they gave up a Dean Kramer. Or maybe in that deal, they gave up a... Chase McDermott or a Cade Povich, like one of their guys in AAA who could have been insurance to make their debut and be a starter at some point in 2024. 
And the Orioles were looking around and thinking, okay, we did that. Maybe we think D.L. Hall and Tyler Wells are both relief pitchers, which is certainly a possibility. I think they are, and the Orioles might certainly think that as well heading into next season. And they thought, we need another veteran starter. And the O's are looking for innings. Now, I think Kyle Bradish can take another step forward, and Grayson Rodriguez can take another step forward next season, and hopefully get a healthy John Means, and I think you can get more out of Cole Irvin. Like, you can get some guys pitching better in 2024. But if the O's were still looking for, and they could be still looking for this guy this offseason, to get another innings-eating veteran, it was Jordan Lyles in 22, it was Gibson in 23, you could argue that for that specific kind of pitcher, when you've already got your top guy, you're looking for a number five veteran who eats innings and keeps you in games. There is a strong argument to be made that Kyle Gibson was the best version of that pitcher in this entire free agent class. If you look at the free agent starting pitchers this year, you know, here's the guys who threw 180 or more innings in 2023. I would consider that in today's baseball, 180 or more innings, you are at least somewhat of an innings eater. Sonny Gray, that's my dream guy for the Orioles that's somewhat in their price range, but with what Aaron Nola already got, right, seven years, $172 million to go back to the Phillies, I think all the prices for pitchers are going to be even higher than we thought. So I don't even know if Sonny Gray is going to be what the Orioles are going to pay for. Aaron Nola, already signed. Blake Snell, O's aren't giving out that money. Jordan Montgomery, O's aren't giving out that money, right? The only two other guys in the free agent starting pitching class who threw 180 or more innings this season were Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn, both signed by the Cardinals in the last two days. Both guys that the Orioles could have certainly brought in. Lance Lynn, who signed for a one-year $10 million deal. Gibson, one-year $12 million with the Cardinals. Lance Lynn had a 5.73 ERA, a full run higher than Gibson's ERA. He also gave up the most home runs in baseball in his time between the White Sox and the Dodgers this season. Kyle Gibson was, across the board, a better pitcher than Lance Lynn this year, and they're very similar age, like mid to late 30s, both of them, both right-handers, who were better when they were younger, but that's what happens to most pitchers. So you look at that, and you say, all right, if you're looking for that cheaper veteran back-of-the-rotation guy, it's kind of, if you're looking for guys with durability, it's Lynn versus Gibson. And then there's a bunch of other guys who have had a lot of questions, right? There's the Hunjin Ryus or the Kenta Maedas, both pitching this season off of injuries and not throwing a lot of innings, right? There's the Seth Lugos who, you know, pitched well last year, but eh, they were relievers for most of their career, just turned back into a starter. There's a lot of question marks about a lot of these guys. For Kyle Gibson, you kind of know what he is, right? And here's a stat that surprised me. All free agent starting pitchers, all of them this offseason, if you sort them by fan graphs war, Kyle Gibson is ninth with 2.6. Now, ninth is not amazing by any stretch, but ninth, I don't think anyone in free agent rankings is thinking, oh, Kyle Gibson is a top 10 starting pitcher on the market this offseason. But depending on what you're looking for, and if the Orioles are just looking for innings and a veteran and someone they know, maybe Kyle Gibson would have been a really good fit to come back. And you look at him, mean, he threw 192 innings. That was tied for 12th most in all of Major League Baseball this season. Most innings an Oriole has thrown in a season since Chris Tillman threw 207 and a third innings all the way back the last time they won the division in 2014. So you just stack all those things up and, you know, you have guys who are above him in that war category, right? Like Eduardo Rodriguez and Michael Waka and Marcus Stroman. All those guys, yeah, they certainly have higher ceilings than Kyle Gibson, but they all suffered different injuries in 2023 and they all have serious questions of can they stay healthy for an entire season or more if you bring them in in free agency. Gibson's kind of shown to this point that yeah there's peaks and valleys and he's not the greatest pitcher in the world but he's durable. He gives you innings. He's been a great leader in the clubhouse. You know Roberto Clemente man of the year nominee for the Orioles and he kind of found a new pitch in that sweeper this year which is allowing him to continue being a big league level starting pitcher. Now, would I have gone out 
and gotten Kyle Gibson? No. No, I think at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't have. But if the Orioles did get, like, trade for a Dylan Cease and then sign Kyle Gibson, I would have been totally fine with that move. Now, if the move was, hey, we're bringing Kyle Gibson back and we're running it back with that starting rotation, that would not have been okay. But if they added someone at the top, Gibson could have been a really good fill-in at the bottom. And I get, right, he's going to be 36, or he is already 36. It's going to be his, his age 36 season. And would the O's have given him two years? Like, I'm sure he wanted that team option, which is what the Cardinals gave him. Now, the team option gives you flexibility if you are the Orioles. They've given one out to Jordan Lyles. They can give it out and then just decline it after the season. But maybe they weren't willing to go to the $12 million. Maybe they just didn't want to run it back with Kyle Gibson. I get it either way. But this is all to say I don't think it was like a slam dunk. Hey, Kyle Gibson's definitely not coming back. I'm sure the Orioles considered it. And I think when you really dig deep into it and think about, okay, what do the Orioles need? And more importantly, unfortunately, what is John Angelos willing to spend? I think Kyle Gibson made more sense for the Orioles this offseason than than I even thought and and that many of you even thought. So he's going to go to St. Louis and I'll be cheering for him and I hope he does well. But, you know, we shall see how this Orioles offseason plays out. And it could play out in a great way, right? They go and get a top starter. They get another veteran guy. They sure up the bullpen. And it's like, yeah, they didn't need Kyle Gibson. But it could also end with a complete dud where we're sitting there in March and we're saying, you know, this team still looks good. This rotation looks solid. But, like, it could probably use a Kyle Gibson at the back end like it had last year. That's a total possibility as well because, as we know, John Angelos, to this point, not willing to spend any money. So it will be interesting to follow. But I just wanted to show that Kyle Gibson was a little better of a free agent this year. Now, some of that's a weaker class. But in general, they're still pitching out there. A little better of a free agent because not a lot of guys eat innings. Kyle Gibson still eats innings at his age, and it's more valuable than you think when so many pitchers are pitching less and less at this point in Major League Baseball. But we talked about the Lance Lynn, talked about the Kyle Gibson move, two things the Euros could have done. I could have seen them doing this offseason. There were some other moves so far in free agency and trades of things that picked up a bit, as I talked about, since the non-tender deadline last Friday, and things that maybe the Orioles could have done. So we'll run through some other moves around baseball and talk about, hey, The O's could have been interested in this and why. That's coming up next to finish off the pod. So to wrap things up here on today's episode as we talk about, hey, Kyle Gibson, salute to Kyle Gibson, right? I mean, yeah, he he had people who uh, didn't love watching him pitch at times, but you look those first couple months of the season, the final month of the season, the fact that he kept the O's in games most nights that he was out there, the fact that he was a really good leader. I salute Kyle Gibson. Again, would I have liked the Orioles to spend a lot more money and bring in a better pitcher than they did in free agency last year? Of course. But for what they paid for Kyle Gibson and what he did for this team, I think it was a net positive for the Orioles, honestly, what Kyle Gibson did. And I know I was beating the Kyle Gibson drum a little more than others down the stretch. And again, He didn't get to start a postseason game. He pitched in one, three good innings. He was really good in September. I felt like I was right with that take. You don't have to agree, but like you see what happened with the other starters, specifically, now I would have started Rodriguez, but specifically Dean Kramer in that game three, and you can't help but think "Mm, Kyle Gibson probably should have started that game. But here we are. He is a St. Louis Cardinal. But there were some other moves. I talked about Lance Lynn already. One year, $10 million with a team option. Something the Euros could have done. He gives up a lot of homers, but he also is a veteran who eats innings. Here's an interesting one that happened around the league. Reynaldo Lopez got three years and $40 million from the Atlanta Braves. I talked about Lopez on my free agent reliever wish list, how good he had been since converted to the bullpen with the White Sox, then pitched for the Angels and the Guardians this year and was still really, really good. Like was incredible down the stretch the final month of the year with the Guardians after they claimed him off waivers from the Angels, got really good stuff, like fastball, high 90s, up to 100, good movement on the slider. Now, the Braves brought him in, and and I think most likely he'll end up as a good reliever for three years, right? He's only 29, that's why he got a three-year contract as a relief pitcher. But there were reports after that deal with the Braves that the Braves are going to let him try to become a starter again. Like He was a starter when he came up to the bigs with the White Sox, and he was a starter for a few years before it just wasn't quite working out. The command was an issue. He couldn't get deep into games, so they moved him into the bullpen. I wouldn't be shocked if it maybe worked out again. Like the Braves have a way of making players better, it seems. And I wouldn't be super shocked if they could get him to do it. Now, it's interesting there. And what that tells me is, okay, the Braves, clearly part of their pitch to Ronaldo Lopez was, we'll let you try to be a starter. And clearly, Ronaldo Lopez thought, I might want to be a starter again. 
I don't think the Orioles were going to give him that chance. It sounds like the Braves are willing, and so it's, it's kind of interesting there that that's another pitch that the Braves have to free agents. It, it worked with Seth Lugo last offseason, right? Going from a reliever with the Mets, signs as a starter with the Padres and pitches well. He's now a free agent again. Maybe it can happen with Ronaldo Lopez. Talked about on an episode last week. Remember, we had Herb Lawrence on, the former host of Locked on White Sox, who now hosts the CHGO White Sox podcast, and talking about the mock trade. You know, we put together a deal for the Orioles to pick up Dylan Cease from the White Sox. It was a good episode. Make sure to go back last week and listen to that one. But because he really wanted Heston Kerstad, I said you got to throw in a reliever with control. And the guy he threw in was the left-hander Aaron Bummer, who is signed through 2026. I thought, okay, you get a guy who's been... You know, he was a little shaky last year, but before that was locked down in his career. Great ground ball lefty, and you get him for three years of control. You add that to two years of Dylan Cease, and yeah, maybe I will throw in Heston Kerstad in this deal. Well, Dylan Cease is still out there potentially, but Aaron Bummer, a couple days later, got traded. It was really the the most interesting trade of the offseason so far. Bummer went to the Braves for five players. The Braves traded five players back to the White Sox for Aaron Bummer. Now, it's a little bit of a different scenario because four of those five players were guys who were on the 40-man roster, who had struggled or been injured recently, and were potential Braves non-tender candidates the next day anyway, which is probably why they felt okay to trade them. For the White Sox, they're like, yeah, give us any players on our 40-man. They make us incrementally better. We have space to play them and see if they'll make us better long-term or not. But it was a couple of former first-round picks, like Braden Shoemake, the shortstop, and some interesting pitching prospects, like Jared Schuster and Mike Soroka, you know, former really good pitcher in the bigs who got just super injured. But a really interesting trade. The White Sox, from that trade, what it tells me is they are looking at this point for quantity of either very close to the big leagues or already major league ready players versus quality of prospects no matter where they are. And that was something Herb talked about when we had him on last week. And he was right. Like, they're not looking for a long-term rebuild. They're not looking as much for, hey, this guy's in high A, but man, you know, he could be special. He's just three years away. They're looking for guys who at worst are in AAA and theoretically are young guys already in the big leagues who they can stack together and see, all right, let's get five of these guys. And their hope is two of these five guys from the Braves turn out to be good contributors for us moving forward. That feels like a win to trade away a reliever. The Orioles have a lot of those players. Now, those players have higher ceilings than the guys on the Braves do, but what it tells me is, hey, the White Sox would be more willing maybe to take on a Jorge Mateo or a Ramon Arias or even a Ryan McKenna, right, in a trade or even someone who, you know, has question marks but could help them, like even like a, a, a Brian Baker type guy who has lots of years of control and has stuff. It just isn't working out at times recently for the Orioles and and definitely like a Joey Ortiz if the Orioles are, are looking to go that way like they are more open or even hey you know who could be a perfect fit like a Kyle Stowers right or a Taron Vavra could be kind of perfect for the White Sox in that trade you just pile up guys like that and you maybe don't have to give up the Heston Kerr stats of the Colton Cowsers and you can maybe still make with still one really good prospect in there make a Dylan Cease trade work I think that trade actually bodes well for the Orioles that they are trying to get Cease this offseason. Another interesting trade the Braves made, Kyle Wright going to the Royals. Been a good pitcher in the past with the Braves, but uh, got surgery, and I don't think he's going to pitch much next year, if at all. They get Jackson Coar, who was a former first-round pick, pitcher for the Royals, came up, wasn't very good, was kind of moved, honestly, into long-relief mop-up duty in the Royals' bullpen this year at the big league level. But he's got some interesting pitch mixes, and he's got some stuff, and the Orioles might have been in right there, I had heard. But in general... Braves getting an interesting pitcher. Royals getting a guy who they can sit on for a year, and he can hopefully help them in 2025. But Coar, if he was available, interesting guy for the Orioles. Now, what I will say is, means the Royals are open. Now, Coar is not like their top, top guy. Again, he didn't really spend much of this year at all, maybe not at all, in their rotation. Like He was mostly in the bullpen. Tells me that the Royals may be a little more open to trading some of their younger pitching. You know, not their, like, prospects, but the guys who have been in the big leagues for a couple of years. Carlos Hernandez is the Brady Singers, potentially, of the world that they could be willing to deal this offseason. So maybe the Orioles look there as well. Cal Quantrill was an interesting guy who was DFA'd by the Guardians. They ended up trading him to the Rockies. That's going to be a disaster with him in Colorado. Guardians got a catching prospect back. 
It was a deal the O's could have made, but Quantrill was due $7 million, and with his struggles this year, maybe the Orioles weren't in for that $7 million. He's more of an innings eater at this point, but kind of an interesting thing there. And then two more moves around baseball that don't affect the current Orioles, but I wanted to just shout out some former Orioles. So the first one would be the Padres hired their manager. Padres were the last team in Major League Baseball who had not selected a manager. I think some of that was because, unfortunately, their owner, Peter Seidler, had passed away last week, and I think they wanted to probably wait around um, a little longer after that, after out of respect to him and his family before like making another move as a front office. But they made their move, and Mike Schilt is the Padres' new manager. He was the manager of the Cardinals a couple of years ago, then went over and was the Padres' bench coach under Bob Melvin. Well, now he is the Padres' manager. And we had heard all this reporting, mostly from Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, that the Padres were basically down to two or three candidates. Now, at some point, they interviewed Phil Nevin as well. That didn't seem like a very good idea. But at one point, they were down to two candidates. It was Mike Schilt and Orioles legend Ryan Flaherty, who has been on the Padres' coaching staff for, I believe, four years now and was getting serious consideration for the manager job. Unfortunately, it looks like he came in second. Mike Schilt got the job. I would think Schilt will keep Flaherty on his staff. Now, Flaherty could theoretically even be elevated to bench coach on this current Padres staff, which would mean a couple years down the road from now, Ryan Flaherty's probably going to be a big league manager somewhere, which is really cool. But I was hoping it was going to be this Padres job because he was up for it very young. The guys like him. Manny Machado's there. And, you know, despite the struggles this year, that's a very talented team that should be back in the playoffs in 2024. What a sight it would have been seeing Ryan Flaherty manage a playoff team. It's going to happen one day, but unfortunately not now. And the last thing, just wanted to salute a former Oriole. Zach Britton announced his retirement on Monday. Salute to Zach Britton. I mean, yes, when you hear Zach Britton as an Orioles fan, I get it. The first thing you think of is him standing in the bullpen while Ubaldo Jimenez takes the mound in the 2016 wildcard game. I get it. But Zach Britton had an unbelievable career for a reliever. Now, he pitched 12 seasons in the big leagues, basically seven and a half-ish with the Orioles, right? About four and a half-ish with the Yankees. Orioles dealt him to the Yankees at the 2018 deadline as part of the sell-off. They got Dylan Tate back in that deal, who, you know, as long as he can be healthy again, was a good reliever to get back. Still isn't anywhere close to what Zach Britton was because Britton was incredible. Now, with the Orioles, right, in those eight seasons, threw over 500 innings and had a 3.22 ERA. That's really good. But that doesn't tell the whole story because that includes when he was a starter those first three years before they moved him into the bullpen in 2014. Remember, he came into spring training in 14 as a reliever, made the team as kind of a middle reliever setup man. Tommy Hunter was the closer to start 2014. Hunter was all right, but they were like, this is really shaky. Britain was locked down. So a couple months into the year, they moved Britain into the closer role, and he basically never gave it up until the Orioles traded him in 2018. But specifically those four years from 2014 through 2017, here are Zach Britton's numbers as the Orioles closer. 246 and a third innings and a 1.61 ERA. Think about how good Felix Bautista was this year. Felix had a 1.48 ERA in about 60 innings. That was a dominant reliever season. Zach Britton did that, but over four consecutive seasons in the most volatile position in baseball, a reliever. Britain did it. And of course, that 2016 season was unbelievable, converted all 47 saves, had a 0.54 ERA that year, basically had a ground ball rate that was like pushing 80% over those four seasons, which is unheard of, like completely unheard of. He was special, right? I salute to him. Man, I mean, what a career he had. And it's cool that his brother, Buck Britton, still in the O system as the AAA Norfolk Tides manager. But yeah, Zach Britton, I think, will go down as an underappreciated career. Like for four years there, he was the most dominant reliever in baseball, at least for my money. It was so fun to watch him lock down games in the ninth inning for the Orioles. I mean, just what a career. And it, it stinks that it kind of ended with a couple of different injuries in a Yankee uniform those past couple of years. It was bad enough that he was a Yankee at the end of his career, but also just watching him go through the injuries. Remember, he returned, I believe it was last year, two years ago, and it was pitching against the Orioles and just threw a pitch to the backstop and was like, I'm injured again and I had to go back on the IL. It was just tough to watch him these past couple of years. But when he was at his peak with the O's, that was a special, special pitcher. So congrats on your retirement, Zach Britton, and we salute you from Birdland. But that'll do it for today's episode. We got one more episode coming up this week. Enjoy your Thanksgiving tomorrow. Hope you get to celebrate with friends and family, however you choose to do so. And then we will be back on Friday for one more episode coming up this week. But until then, I am Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.